cleanse my guilt and pride Blood of Christ the crucified From your hands, your feet, your side Jesus, I trust in you Of course, we have an example no, We have an example in Ecclesiastes I've pointed out to you before In regards to abortion Because abortion kills children from the womb in Ecclesiastes chapter, let me see, I think it's chapter 2, verse 21. I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 6 and verse 3. I wonder if I couldn't find that. It says, If a man beget a hundred children, live many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul be not filled with good, and moreover he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. So a man could live a life, a full life. And uh, not live in the goodness of the Lord and not uh, be a vessel of honor. And uh, it's better, it's better to be aborted than this. An untimely birth is better than he. For it cometh in fancy and departeth in darkness, and the name thereof is covered with darkness. Moreover, it hath not seen the sun nor known it. This hath rest rather than the other. And yea, though he live a thousand years twice told, and yet enjoy no good, and that all go to the same place. We're talking about death there. We're talking about the same place in Sheol. Because all don't go there. This man went to Hades, but the child went to Abraham's bosom. But they both went to Sheol. Well, that shows you that God considers innocency among children, or among babies at least. But Ahijah was a child, a small child, and God didn't impute iniquity to Ahijah, to Abijah, excuse me, Abijah, the young child's name is Abijah, and God didn't impute iniquity to Abijah, and so, you know, that, that leads me to believe that the further you get away from being born, the more dangerous it is as far as responsibility, because the more knowledge you get, not the age of accountability or the age of reason, as the theologians have told us, because I, I frankly can't find that in the Bible. But God imputes iniquity with knowledge. Him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, him that is sin. Here we've got Jacob and Esau. Well, remember, Jacob and Esau, God showed his election to this, this example of Jacob and Esau. But Jacob and Esau didn't either one of them die as a child or die as a baby. They both manifested a vessel, a vessel of honor and a vessel of dishonor. And that's what they were elected to do. From what I can see, every child is born, is, is born with a fresh, clean spirit, albeit they're given also the nature of their parents. And they've got a choice to make, to follow that spirit or follow the nature of their parents. Everyone eventually chooses to go the way of the flesh and become corrupt. Their soul becomes corrupt, and eventually their spirit becomes corrupt. When the spirit becomes corrupt, that child has to be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Shall a man, mostly said a man, because somewhere, somewhere in there, I don't know what the age is, and I don't know that there is such an age. If different children are different, they've been raised different, some of them have been raised with discipline, and they're, they are more conscientious, uh, some of them have been raised with no discipline, and they're very corrupt. And they'll just make your life hell on earth, you know. So I don't think there is an age there, but I believe that when the spirit dies, that person is responsible for who died, they must be born again. Let me think what else I might have. When their spirit is given them from God when they're born, a fresh, clean spirit from God when they're born, when it dies, you follow in the flesh. When it becomes corrupt, you follow in the flesh. And that's why I'm calling death is not a physical lack of existence, but a, uh, becoming corrupt. Then they're uh, responsible. Of some of y'all came in real late. You know, probably don't know what in the world I'm talking about. We've been fitting together the, the difference between election when God, before Jacob and Esau was even born, he loved one and hated the other, and the fact that children who die all seem to go to be with the Lord. Young children and babies 
all things go and be with the Lord. Jesus was the one who breathed into Adam the breath of life. Because everyone was created through him, the scripture says, Colossians 1, 16, and John chapter 1, and verse 3, 4, and 5. Everyone was created through him. He breathed into Adam the breath of life. God, the Father, created everything through Christ. There's nothing created that wasn't created through Christ. And so he breathed into Adam the breath of life. And the whole race of Adam fell, became corrupt. And then Jesus breathed again, the second Adam. He was the second Adam. He breathed again his spirit of life into his new creation. And by the way, I mean, you don't have to follow your spirit even now. You can follow your flesh and go the opposite way again. We have, I mean, a born-again person has the opportunity to follow their spirit and go with God, or they can follow their fallen nature and go with the rest of creation. As a matter of fact, the second time, we have one disadvantage. The disadvantage is that we still have the nature that is passed on to us from our parents. We have a fresh, clean spirit, a human spirit, like Christ's human spirit, and we have this fallen soul because the life of the flesh is in the blood, and the blood that was passed on to us is the blood that's in us, and the nature of our parents is in us, and we have to overcome them. But you know what he said in uh, Romans chapter 8? Notice this. You know, Paul told us that he was in bondage in Romans chapter 7. He said he wanted to do right. But he saw a different law in his members, warring against the law of his mind and bringing him into captivity under the law of sin, which was in his members. He said, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me out of the body of this death? He wanted power over the body of that death. That was Romans 7, the last oh, four verses of Romans 7. He wanted power over that body of death. He was a Christian. He wanted to serve God. But he wanted power over that body of death. You know what God did to give Christians power over the body of death? He gave the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And a person without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they don't have that power. Let me prove it to you. Romans 8, uh, starting verse 7, says, Because the mind of the flesh is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. And they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh... But in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. That's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Now watch carefully. But if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Spirit, that's different. That is your own personal human spirit, the Spirit of Christ. Why? Because Christ was man and he was God. He was man in that he had a human spirit, a soul, and a body. He was God in that the Spirit that dwelt in him, according to Romans chapter 1 and verse 3, was that of the Son of God. Now, when we're born again, we receive a born-again Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit comes to do three things. Jesus said, He'll take of mine and shall declare it unto you. What does He do? He comes to give us, first of all, the Spirit of Christ. That means a born-again Spirit, a holy, fresh, clean Spirit. Second of all, as we follow that spirit, he gives us the born-again soul. And if we receive bare fruit in the realm of the soul, he's going to give us a born-again body. Okay? But what is that? That is the manifestation of Christ in you, spirit, soul, and body. Okay? Well, even if you have the spirit of Christ, but don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have power over that body. Watch what he says here. Verse 9, Romans 8, verse 9. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. But if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. That means he doesn't even belong to him. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you do not belong to him. Okay? If you don't have a born-again human spirit, you don't belong to him. Because Jesus had a born-again human spirit, you see. Okay, now what? And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. That's where Paul was. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Hey, the disciples were that way when they were following Jesus, before they received the Holy Spirit. He said, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus told them that. Did they have a born-again human spirit? Yeah. Jesus told them, he said, 
You're clean through the word which has been spoken unto you. So the disciples said, you can't be clean up without a born again spirit. They had a reborn spirit through the word that was spoken into them. Okay? Now, he says, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So here you've got a born again person who was born again in their spirit, but they have no power over their body, the body of death. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? He said. They have no power over their body of death until they receive the Holy Spirit. Watch. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that's the Holy Spirit. He that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead shall give life to your mortal body. Everybody thinks that's talking about the resurrection of the dead. It's not. He said, give life to your mortal body. Mortal body. That's this physical body. God will give life. Where you had death in your mortal body and had no power over it, he gives you life in your mortal body through his spirit that dwelleth in you. So he's talking about two spirits there. You know, we've been told, I mean, I've been told, and, and most of the religions I've been around, they've taught that when you're born again, that's when you get the Holy Spirit, you know. And even the Pentecostal groups, they say, well, yeah, when you're born again, you get the Holy Spirit. But when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you get more of it. But that's not what the Bible teaches. For instance, let me show you the same thing in um, Jeremiah. No, uh, let me, let's look at Ezekiel. I think it's, more, it's probably easier to see. In Ezekiel 36. The promise of the new covenant is in Jeremiah and it's in Ezekiel. Find a place in the New Testament where the Christians didn't go on to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can't find that. As soon as they found out about it, it was theirs. And uh, today, it's optional. You know, I don't know why it's optional. It never was supposed to be optional. I'm not saying a person's lost, because he just said in Romans 8 that they belong to God if they had the Spirit of Christ. They just didn't have power without the Spirit of God. And Ezekiel 36, in verse 24, he says, For I will take you from among the nations gather you out of the countries and will bring you into your own land and I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. This is what he did with his disciples, remember? I think it's back John, either John 13 or John 15. He said, you're clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. God gave him a born again spirit through the word he spoke. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. He spoke life into them. Okay? And I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Now, of course, the theologians put a small s here. In this case, I believe they're right. It should be a small s because it's talking about your living spirit. He says, a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit, now they capitalized it here, and I think they're right again. He says, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Cause you to walk in my statutes. The Holy Spirit is power from God. You shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my, he didn't say witness, he said you will be my witnesses. In other words, that is the power to walk the right life, to be a witness, you see. And he says, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my ordinances and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Well, you know, what, what happened, I mean, along the way? Why, why is now the baptism called the second blessing, you know? When actually it was always a part of the first place. I mean, it was, you know, as soon as the church started, the baptism of the Holy Spirit came right along with baptism in water, you know. I mean, what, where did we go so far astray in, in thinking this? That people can live the Christian life without everything that God provided. It never was meant to be that way. We're commanded to be full of the Spirit of God. Does anybody see what I'm talking about? Or do you disagree or what? Well, if you see that that's what it says, you shouldn't disagree. That's if you obey the corrupt nature that's been passed on to you genetically through your parents, you will 
begin to fall into corruption. First flesh, then soul, then spirit. The death is continually taking place. It's continually because the more corrupt you become, the more dead you are. It's a spiritual death, not a physical death. It just ends in physical death. Because our spirit is our connection with the spirit. I mean, when it's given to us, it's good, it's right. It's just that if you don't obey, it's like the Bible talks about in Hebrews about defiling your conscience. Your conscience is a part of your spirit, and it tells you to do good, not to do wrong, do right, don't do wrong. But the more you disobey it and ignore it, the quieter and quieter it becomes. And in our life, if we don't listen to our spirit, we come to the place where we don't hear it anymore. We're not led by it anymore. We don't hear it anymore. A child, as they grow up, they become more and more corrupt because they follow their flesh. I believe that that process is different if you raise up your child in the way they should go. But still, they're going to fall into corruption. They're still going to need to be born again because they haven't. They don't have this. They don't have the Holy Spirit to empower them to follow their human spirit. I mean, the way God leads us, think about this now. We're spirits on the body. The way God leads us is the opposite of the devil. The devil leads our, he wants to take possession of our soul. And the way he takes possession of our soul is through our flesh. God's just the opposite. He wants possession of our soul. But the way he takes possession of our soul is through our spirit. So here we are in the middle of our soul, our natural life, you know, our, our nature. And we have the responsibility to obey our spirit and so obey the spirit of God, rather than obey our flesh and so obey the spirit of the devil. So, I mean, we have a decision to make. We've been given a spirit and a flesh. We have a decision to make. As a born-again Christian, we have a, a decision to make. Are we going to follow the flesh and die, or are we going to follow the spirit and live? If we follow the spirit, we're following God. If we follow the flesh, we're following the devil. A child, when they're born, the only difference is their spirit, they don't have the spirit of God. If they follow the flesh, they're going to die. They always do, and they always die. They always come. When I talk about die, I'm talking about death while you're alive, you know, spiritual death, you know. You are accountable when you know to do good. The Bible says that. That's all it says. It don't have no age. It's to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And sin is imputed when you know what's right and what's wrong. The thing about a child is the older they get, the more quiet their conscience gets because they get more and more used to disobeying and rebelling against it. And so they come to a place where they must be born again. He's not, Jesus is not talking about a child there. They must be born again. He's not talking about a child. Because a little child doesn't have to be born again. They enter the kingdom. Because their spirit is not dead yet. But the older they get, the more corrupt their soul becomes, and the more corrupt their spirit becomes, until they must be born again in order to see the kingdom of heaven. If you give a, a child, the difference in a little child, a little child, they're very open to God. You can talk to them about God, and they, they understand, and they receive it, and they see a lot. You, know? you don't teach them anything. Their spirit is still alive, but they don't have education. You know, you have to train your spirit. We have to train our spirit. The Bible says, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. People have spirits that are not, that are defenseless. Now, your, your spirit becomes defenseless unless you put the word of God in there and educate your spirit. See, back years ago, when I was a little child, they told me, when I was in the Catholic Church, they told me this was wrong and that was wrong. Things that weren't even wrong, they told me they were wrong. And if I did them, my conscience smoked me. When I was a little child, my conscience told me I was doing wrong, you know. And which the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 13, that that's true. I mean, if you, you don't, you're not supposed to go against your conscience, no matter what, you know. So I had to re-educate my conscience according to the Word of God when I became born again in order to have the sword of the Spirit, the sword which belongs to the Spirit, the sword of belong to your flesh, is the sword that belongs to the Spirit. And that's the Word of God. You've got to empower your spirit to win the battle against your flesh. That's what the Word of God is all about. It is to empower your spirit to win the battle against the flesh and the devil. For we wrestle not against 
flesh and blood, principalities and powers, rulers, guards, and high places. And uh, where should we go from here? <laughs> Idea of what? Well, that's true. And you know, you can have the Holy Spirit. You can have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and not obey it. Just because you have it don't mean anything. It's all you obey. And are you walking in faith? Because if you have it and don't walk in faith, you're not going to get anywhere either, you know? And you'll find that the people who are filled with the Holy Spirit have more faith and walk closer to God and have more power because Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, you know, that um, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Which will be my witness and say, yeah, you can offend the Holy Spirit. You can become you can become reprobate, rejected by the Holy Spirit. I mean, all those things can happen. And you cannot, I mean, because you're filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you're going to stay filled with the Holy Spirit. This is contrary to a lot of Pentecost. I mean, in Acts chapter 2, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, they were refilled with the Holy Spirit, the same people. Why? Because it gets used up. Jesus said, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water, this speaking of the Spirit, that they that believed on him were to receive. So it goes out. I mean, it is used up. The power of the Holy Spirit is used up in in uh, in the anointing and the things that we do, and praying for the sick and speaking the words of Christ. Well, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit ever leaves you completely in this way. I'm saying that in the book of Acts, they obviously had to be refilled. It took, a, it took a fellowship with God to stay full of the Holy Spirit, not just a one-time thing like a lot of Pentecostal folks. I mean, they may go on the rest of their life and speak in tongues, but they may not be filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, listen, it says in Acts 4 and, t- and 31, when they had prayed, the place was shaken, wherein they were gathered together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. How can they be filled with the Holy Spirit? They were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. I mean, how can, you, how can you be filled twice unless you've been emptied once? I mean, the point is, if Jesus said, out of your innermost being shall flow the Spirit, then this power is imparted to people around you. Probably has to be well, it doesn't seem like it. It seems like here he's talking about the same disciples, you know, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 31. It seems like he's talking about the same people. Remember what Jesus said. He said, out of your innermost being shall flow. It's got to come out. I mean, uh, it's got to be replenished. When they prayed to God, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Christians who had been baptized in the Spirit. I think the point is that uh, we have to maintain the relationship with God to keep full of the Holy Spirit. If we don't, we won't keep full of the Holy Spirit. Even though the gifts of God or without repentance. He won't take the gift back. He won't take the speaking in tongues back, necessarily. But you may speak in tongues and still not be filled with the Holy Spirit. A person has to stay full of the Holy Spirit. And that's clearly what it's teaching there in Acts chapter 2. The same people in Acts chapter 2 that were preaching are the same ones over in Acts chapter 4 that were filled again with the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, yeah, there's no doubt there were 3,000 more people that were put in there, but it was also talking about them, the people that were praying. Like you said, the oil, the lamps were going out. Personally, I believe this. I've never heard this in any Pentecostal church before. I know that you get the Holy Spirit by this experience of the Holy Spirit coming into you, but I also know that you get filled with the Spirit when you get filled with the spiritual words of God. Because you have a capacity to be filled with the Spirit more so when you're full of the Word of God. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit, and they are life. Therefore, if you receive more of His Word, you receive more of His Spirit, more of a capacity to be full with His Spirit. Right, he breathed on, on, on the end of the book of John, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And some people say, well, they received it there. Some people say, no, it wasn't manifest until Pentecost, when the Russian mighty wind came. And said, well, I mean, it doesn't make you immune to sin. I mean, having the Holy Spirit, I think most Pentecostals think that having the Holy Spirit is makes, gives you a, makes you a shoe in to the kingdom of heaven. You know, but really, having the Holy Spirit doesn't save you. It's obeying the Holy Spirit to save you. When he said that the Holy Spirit would give life to your mortal body, life came out of Jesus. It came out of him in his words. It came out of him when he laid hands on people. It came out of his garments, you know, and healed the woman. Life was in him. 
and life that was imparted to others was in you. But that's not the case if the person is not filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, their spirit, they do good to walk with God without being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because, I mean, you can't find, when you read the book of Acts, you can see that the very foundation of Christianity was to repent, receive a born-again spirit, and then be filled with the Holy Spirit. The temple and the old covenant, that's very clear. The, the, the typology is very clear. What good would the temple be if the Spirit of God didn't dwell in it? And yet, when they built the temple, house made without hands, they couldn't have any sound of tools in it or anything like that, because it had to be built without hands like us. It was supposed to be a temple built without hands. In other words, without the works of man, so to speak. Well, when they built it and they sanctified it, it still didn't have the temple, the Spirit of God in it. When they had their uh, dedication of the temple, and the Spirit of God came in the form of the Shekinah glory and dwelt in the temple. That's the first time the Spirit came and dwelt there. What good was the temple without the Spirit? It was meant to dwell in the temple, you know? I think a lot of people are going to fall away because they won't obey the Scriptures in this regard. Because the Holy Spirit is power to do what you need to do. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but I tell you, I've gotten myself in situations before where uh, I just didn't think it was there, and the power showed up right when it was needed, and right when it was necessary. And it even awed me. Has that ever happened to you? Yet? Well, you know, you think, wow, you know, you get yourself in a situation. You think ahead of time, what would I do in that situation? But when you get there, and the Holy Spirit just manifests Himself, you know. Another thing I felt like the Lord showed me, you know, it's it's uh, Judah that dwelt in Zion. Judah means praise. And Judah identifies the spirit-filled people, the gospel, full gospel people. Judah, that, that name identifies them. It separates them from the rest of Christianity. The northern ten tribes went further astray and missed the boat many, many more times than Judah ever did. And uh, they worshipped the false Christ more often, which was the... Uh, the golden calves, you know, the two golden calves that they set up over there. I think that's a type of today. I think the Lord showed me it's a type of today. The northern ten tribes are the non-spirit-filled groups, and Judah represents the spirit-filled groups, the ones that inhabited Zion. Zion was the city that escaped when Babylon conquered the people of God. Think about that. Well, we were pointing out this book, you know, earlier. You know who escaped? from that Armenian holocaust there. It was the spirit filled people. They escaped. They were warned because they believed in prophecy and they believed in the prophets. And they escaped. And a lot of non-spirit filled Christians were killed. Millions of them were killed right there. In America, same thing's fixing to happen. A lot of people who are not taking the warning, many of them are people who have not been filled with the spirit of God. Because the spirit of God opens your eyes to dreams and visions and revelations and deeper things of the Spirit. And uh, the Spirit of God makes you respect prophets, you know, and prophecies. And, of course, what we get from the true prophets and the prophecies is that we better get ready because another Holocaust is coming, you know. You know, not only, not only do every Christian, does every Christian need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, I say we need to continually be baptized in the Holy Spirit, or we're going to be like those people. They needed power from God to stand up to the persecution they were receiving. And they got together and prayed, and God filled them again with the Holy Spirit. You can quench my thirsting soul Pure as water made me whole Let your streams of mercy flow Oh Jesus, I trust in you Though the mountains fall into the sea Though the rivers rise, I still believe For your mercy stands and your word is true Oh Jesus, I trust in you